This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for the suffering, the suffering podcast. 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 How often do the definitions of our world betray us? If someone doesn't think the way we think or act the way we act, does that make them wrong? If someone does not fit in our perfect little box, it is difficult to accept them into our tribe. Who's to say that our tribe is correct? It may be possible for the propaganda to be a false prophet, guiding us down a path that may not be in our best interest, but in their best interest. Be cautious of what you're told and make up your own mind. Your inner moral compass will define what your tribe should be. Nobody wants to admit when you're wrong, but doing so early could prohibit lifelong regret. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felice and welcome to the Suffering Podcast. If you're a fan of overcoming adversity and overcoming suffering, then we're for you because that's what we do and that's the stories that we highlight. So do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and please comment. Don't forget to ring the bell so you can get notified of all of our new content and follow us on social media. That way you can find out exactly what we're up to. On this episode, we welcome Matt Stanislao. See, I got it. Yeah, Stanislao. You got it. Got it. Just, it ends in a vowel, too, and you yeah, got it no, right this time. To talk about the suffering of a gay police officer. We kind of let the cat out of the bag with that one there, so you pretty much know what it's about. Have a good night, everybody. See you <laughs> later. No, Matt has fought and fought and fought just to be a civil servant, to do a job he loves, and he had to jump through some hoops that we most people don't understand matt thanks so much for coming in pleasure to be here before we go any further let's give a big shout out to our marquee sponsor that's toyota of hackensack we don't trust anybody but we do trust them so go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car and so, my father didn't crash his, his toyota now he yeah the one that he got there we'll get his father back in there don't worry about it <laughs> So, Matt, each week we take a question from our audience. This week, I love the, I love the name of this. Is kind of why I pulled this one. It comes from Icky Azalea, which I thought was hilarious. And it says, what opinion of yours changed after speaking with people? You're our guest, Matt. Let's, why don't you lead this one off? Um, I'd have to say it's probably vets. With vets? Yeah. Veterans? Vet, yeah, veterans. Because they, I mean, when I was doing some of my clinical work, um, you start realizing how much trauma really impacts their world forever um, and just what PTS is really about. Um, oh, you see that? So PTS. Yes, he dropped oh, the day. Nice. Um, nice. So you're, do you know why that's done now? No, we, we, we did it because I don't like the word disorder. It's not a disorder. Do you know why, though? It is no longer considered a disorder. Because it's curable? No. Hmm. Please share. It's actually, it's actually deeper than that. It's actually the body or the brain's natural response to trauma. Therefore, since it's a natural response to trauma, it wouldn't be considered a disorder. I love that. I'm going to steal it. I'm sorry. You're, can, that, no, I'm, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm <laughs> can you write it. that down? <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, That's, it's actually a part of the, you know, like, it, when there's a like diagnostic material that we go through when you're training people or when we, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not in practice right now, but when uh, a psychotherapist or a social worker is, you know, doing a, an assessment on somebody, you know, we'll, we'll pick up on certain things. Um, but over time, certain disorders or certain behavior patterns have been categorized, and some of them have gotten far complicated. Just, it just The words just continue to extend and go yeah. longer and longer. But this one actually went backward and shortened because, you know, the, the brain scans... Uh, the brain markers that they're they're looking at, they're saying, wait a minute, this is actually a natural response. If people don't have this response to certain traumas, they have the disorder. <laughs> yeah, they, they have the disorder. They actually <laughs> have something else. Like if I mean, if their temperament is just cold as ice, and they're dealing with trauma constantly, and it just does not impact them, there's a good chance that they probably have some forms of severe psychopathy. Really. When Mike and I talk about it, I don't like that word disorder. It makes me feel dirty, like there's something wrong there's with There's something me. wrong with you. But yeah. what you're saying, it makes it even more clear that there's nothing wrong with me for reacting this way to trauma. I, lo I, I love that. Mike, what do you think? You know, I mean, it, it's really every day you, you know, someone could change your mind about anything. Hmm. You know, I mean, you, you, you're so set. Listen, as a stubborn Italian you're kind of set in your ways and you don't, you don't necessarily hear other people's opinions, you know, or, or, or agree with their opinions until they actually talk to you. I mean, I don't have anything really 
like any one incident, but as long as you just talk to someone and get their side of it. Like we talk, well, we don't talk about politics on here, but there's good and bad on both sides in politics. You know, some people lean right, some people lean left, and the, the, the right doesn't agree with the left, and the left doesn't agree with the right. Well, you don't have to but dig, there's, it doesn't take long. No, you don't have to dig too deep into someone's background before you start realizing how they became who they became. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing that I kind of noticed. Like when people, you know, maybe they hear my story and they want to tell me something about themselves. Uh, it shocks me how fast they go right into it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you don't, you just assume that, you know, people in front of you are like, hey, how's it going? You, you, you leave and that's the end of it. But once in a while when they want to talk to you and they're trying to tell you something or maybe they don't know how exactly to approach it. Um, but once you allow them or give them a platform to, to give you what they're looking to, to, to tell you, it never ceases to amaze me how fast they're able to tell you what's been going on in their life. I, I just think it's going, to, going into everything with, a, with an open mind. You know, like I said, you, you, you have your set principles. Someone else has other principles. Just listen. No, it's opinions versus beliefs. Yeah, exactly. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I've heard this many times. I didn't. I wish I made this up, but there's a there's a big difference between an opinion and a belief. Beliefs are really difficult to change. Opinions can be changed. That's why I try. And, uh, there's very few things in this world that I have a belief in. I have a belief in my family. I have a belief in God. I have a belief in these things. My opinion on how to. What about me? What? Oh, you have know, a belief in me. I have lots of opinions about you. Yeah, yeah no beliefs, though. <laughs> no beliefs. Um, but, but I love sitting there and having a discussion with somebody because I can do it civilly uh, because I, I want to hear their side of the story. It's kind of a challenge where if I'm trying to make a point, I'm going to try to change their mind civilly, and I want them to do the same with me. And you, that's how exchange of ideas happen. For me, po not to, the post-traumatic stress. So initially, when I was trying to figure out what was going on in my brain, I always thought my post-traumatic stress was a reaction to thinking I'm going to die and not dying. And I was, I was very steadfast on that belief that that's what post-traumatic stress is. Mm -hmm. Going down this journey with this podcast and speaking to as many people as we spoke to with post-traumatic stress, I found out that it's so much deeper than that. It, it, every aspect of your life from how you grew up to what you did growing up can affect who gets it, who gets it bad, who has chronic, who has, you know, uh, complex. It's, there's so many different facets to it. For me to tell everybody and, and openly tell everybody that it's thinking you're going to die and not dying, it was very irresponsible of me to say that because it's so much more. Well, and, that's what's, that, and that's through talking to people. You actually said that to me on episode nine, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Yep, I did. That's the first time I heard it. I did. And I, I, <laughs> I, I strongly believed that. Now I have an opinion. So I changed, the, I changed my outset. But that came from talking to so many different people oh, with, yeah. this, with this no longer disorder thing. See, it's not a disorder, people. I was right. I just. Well, I mean, like the other thing we learned through Gene, right? People don't commit suicide. Yeah. So our vocabulary has changed over the course of this show. You don't commit suicide. You're lost to suicide or you take your life. You don't commit. So you commit is mm. if you say commit suicide to somebody who has a family member who took their life. It's like it's they a get bad word. Very offended. Yeah. It's not midget. It's little person. <laughs> we learned that. You know, we, this show. Our friend, we got a little person's friend. That's that's a very, very offensive word. to them. Sometimes it's actually even personal to the person who. Um, they, they don't have a preference one way or another. And they'll tell you, it's okay, you can tell me one or the other. Um, but I always leave it open uh, whenever talking to somebody who uh, you don't know. Just uh, tell me how you'd like me to, re to refer to you. Yeah. Well, that yeah, so I, I, I did that. So Ashley. Ashley, um, you know, we, we obviously made a connection through Mark. I still Mark don't know your, what to refer to Ashley as. She, it's her. <laughs> It's her. Ashley, I'll tell you what I refer to Ashley as. Friend. I refer to friend. She's my friend. She's a friend. She's my friend. Well, just, just Ashley. And and you know what? I, I support whatever she wants to support. She knows that I don't believe certain things that she believes in, but that's good. We have that open dialogue. I don't want to speak to myself all the it, time. It's not for you to believe in what she believes in. Her our So I, I could tell you what we disagree with, and that's transgender going into female sports. That's what I disagree, I, I disagree yeah. on because it's biology at that point. It's not what you believe you are. But that's my opinion. 
That's my opinion. And it's hard for me to change because I, I have a lot of statistical information on that one. But anyway, yeah. Icky that, Azalea. That had to be the longest. That was a, that was a long one. The, the that longest was a good, fun one. Though. <laughs> Icky Azalea, thank you so much for sending that one in. Keep sending in your questions. We will try to get them on the air. So I've, I've been hearing about you for good, the better part of a year wow. through Mark. Um, he's like, oh, you got to talk to this guy. He's got an amazing story, and we were able to connect, and we were able to bring you in. And I want to thank you so much for sitting down oh, with us. Oh, it's great. I'm glad. I'm, I'm now that I'm listening to your podcast. I'm kind of hooked too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what we do. We we're like uh, we're like a bad commercial. <laughs> we just get in your you know. It's like by men in you know. Or, or <laughs> before you know, you'll be singing one eight seven seven cars for kids. Cars you know, for you kids. can oh, never oh, forget that oh, song. Oh now, my God, I know that. <laughs> I know the phone number off the back of my head. So. Matt, I want you to tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Obviously, we kind of we kind of threw it away in the title of this story, but I want I want you to tell everybody who you are. Matt Stanislao, born, raised Jersey. Where'd you, uh, where'd you grow up? South Plainfield, central part of the state. Mm-hmm. For from some people, they there, still there's no there, that. there's North right, Jersey fine. and South it's Jersey. Still there's the there's northern there's... part of this, <laughs> the southern northern part of the there's state. There's no West Jersey. Like, there's central can, Jersey. I'm cons- sorry. They consider Trenton. <laughs> Man, I didn't know West. that would have been controversial. You told me to. <laughs> they consider Trenton West Jersey. Is this politics? I take. Should the, we not be talking I, I don't about know. this? It might be. I take the turnpike south to get to Trenton. It's Listen, South Jersey. Most right, people from North. I'm a South Jersey transplant. Most people from North Jersey think you go over to Raritan Bridge and you are in South Jersey. You're in South Jersey. Absolutely. That's like a Mason Dixon line. Yeah, that's the Mason Dixon line. That's where Jersey. that's where Taylor Ham becomes, becomes corporal. corporal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say that. I, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dad was a cop for like almost 20 years. Oh, your legacy. Um, yeah, and uh, he did not want me to go down this path. You know, it's funny you say that because I don't, I don't want my, my yeah. either my boys to be Especially involved. Especially this days. day and age. Yeah. Uh, it was for different reasons, though. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, went to college, four-year degree, got on the job after going to the academy, alternate route. What year? Um, what year did you get on? Uh, two thousand two in Booton Township. See now, now that alternate route is. I have the utmost respect for these people. Ooh. You're you're going into the academy. You're paying your own way through the academy. Yeah. You're not getting a paycheck. But you're going to college. Okay, yeah. so what's you better, get- going alternate route or going to college and having to pay? You're paying either way. Yeah. Either way, I was in my third. I was finishing up my third year when I got in, um, and I told my mother, I'm like, Ma, I got into the academy. I'm I think I'm going to jump in and uh, and do this. And she was upset because she was like, you're not going to finish college. You know, we told you not to do this in the first place. And I said, Ma, I'm going to go back to school. I promise you I only got like 18 credits left. Trust me, I'm going to I'm going to do this. But and this isn't like you're going to f- you are going to follow a dream somewhat. I don't know if this was sure. your dream or not, well, but it's not like you're taking a risk. You, you're you're into as long as you're not a screw up. You're going to be making a decent living, probably a better living than when you, if what you would have gotten had you gone to college four years. Well, ironically, the places that were hiring required a four-year degree. Mm. So when I graduated, I think, I think all of them do now, don't they? I don't, a large I don't. majority of them do, but I mean, if it's civil service, eighteen GED, less than three DWIs, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, less than three citizen, yeah, convictions. By the way, unbelievable. So. So, so unless it's like a chief's test down where they have specific standards, and sometimes they say it unless you're um, about to get the degree. I had, I was, like, I was 18 credit shy. And then once I got out of the academy, the places that I wanted to work in were all giving me kind of like, not a door slam, but basically like you're up against people who have a, have a degree, so you're not going to get in. And uh, I was doing pretty good in undergrad, and I was like, I'm going to finish this. And I did. I was my valedictorian when I graduated. And I ended up. You're not one of those overachiever types, are you? Unfortunately, that's disgusting. But for the wrong reasons. Do you feel like you had to prove something? Oh, absolutely. I can't spell valedictorian. I can't even (laughs) say it. Valedictorian. I can't spell it. Never mind. Be one. So you know, step back. You get into police world. Obviously, we're here to talk because you're gay. Is he really? Yeah, he's gay. That's well. If he if he's not gay, we got to rename this episode really quick. <laughs> at what I want to go back into your childhood for a little bit, and at what point did you know that girls weren't for you? Well, I don't know. Were girls for you at one time, and you figured it just wasn't? No, never, never, never a girlfriend, never a little kiss behind the school. 
uh, only as a dare in second grade at the lunchroom. <laughs> Usually it was a reverse on me. The other girls dared that girl to kiss me. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's weird how you brought that up and I was able to recall that one. But other than that, um, and it was only on the cheek. Um, and that's as close as I ever got. I, you and you never made eye contact. Just, right, right. I don't even want to count that one. He held his nose. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. And like, she meant nothing to me, I it swear. Was, <laughs> you, you, it's not, um, it, it's almost like an absence. Uh, so it's, it wasn't there. So, um, and oftentimes my friends that I grew up with would notice that absence and be like, you know, so a girl would walk by or something that they would find attractive and I would still be playing Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. <laughs> they were all staring at her ass as she walked by and you're yeah. like, no, no, no. and I'm just like still in this game, you know, so, um, and they're just like, because hmm. I'm, I'm very intrigued at why certain people have an affinity towards same sex. Like I'm, I'm mm. just... I, d I never had that feeling, so it's not something I can relate to. Right. <laughs> Except if Man. it's him. You're holding yourself back. Yeah. I am. Listen, I have, a, I have an unrequited love for he, Mike, he like went, everybody. He went to band camp back in the day. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to understand that feeling because, you know, as this becomes more acceptable, socially acceptable, it's, you're going to find out more and more people were gay that you grew up with or more and more kids around the neighborhood. And I want to be able to be prepared and have an open discussion with them and understand them. Uh, the only way I can like describe it is, well, what, what felt natural to you is essentially what, hap what felt natural to me. Like you uh, said, you're, you're, a girl walks by, your friends are looking at her, right? Yeah. You're not interested. On the other side, if a guy walked by, uh, it would be the opposite yeah. then, and right, it would be the same thing, but just for the same sex. But did you gender. have to keep that in? Because obviously, you, you're telling me your friends were looking at women. And the, then... Yes. Um, ironically, my friends didn't care. They they knew actually. I think they knew that I was gay before I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the Rob Halford thing. So but Rob Halford, was, Rob Halford yeah. from Judas Priest came out and he came screaming out of the closet. Oh, sure, turtle but lover. Judas Priest. I mean, <laughs> but when he came out, everybody was like, "That kind of makes sense." We kind of knew. It's like George yeah. Michael. Duh. However, <laughs> it was somewhat acceptable still because he had a product that people wanted. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So it almost didn't matter. And I think actually, just jumping ahead, when it comes into police work, sometimes it actually doesn't really matter if you're gay as long as you're masculine um that's a that, good that's a great that you, point or that you have a temperament that is structured in a way that seems to fit the profession or you know their culture so but, you know i i think in, in law enforcement like you said if you're masculine but there's females that do the job that are very slight i think it's but not ultra if feminine could, if you could do the job not, you that's, have all, to, that's all I care you about. You have to be assertive. Yeah. Um, if they pick up on any type of meek and mild nature, they're going to see that as a weakness, not as a, uh, a strength in your ability to be compassionate towards others. Um, and I mean, clearly this profession leans towards having a cooler temperament, you know, as far as what is necessary to get things done um, in crises. You can't be like a bleeding heart where the minute you see something that is you know, graphic in some nature and you just fall apart. Well, your voice is very de-escalating, I got to tell you. It's, it's uh, your, your tone and your camber is very, very de-escalating. I almost fell asleep a couple minutes Bef ago. Before we get into that, at what age did you finally come to accept? Well, I was kind of forced to accept it. Um, forced to accept it? Yeah, that one needs some explanation. Because <laughs> well, a, a guy got dared to kiss him. Like, yeah. Kiss him, kiss him. <laughs> no, nothing like that, nothing like that, but... Um, I mean, we're going to childhood. Uh, I was my parents found out that I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I was at a friend's house. I told them I was at a friend's house, and I ended up going somewhere else. And they found that I lied. And then they started calling all my friends. Nobody knows where I am except for one person who I told. And uh, this is chat rooms in the '90s, you know. So um, the BBS, and, uh, the bulletin board systems, yeah, yeah. Um, and I already met them once before, and they were. I, I was like, I don't even care at this point if I got kidnapped. I could not live with my family and in that environment, which was very toxic. It's very, very um, 
not dark, but just full of hate. Um, my father, when he would come home from work, man, you had to be careful. Just the things that he would say, um, you, you, you really had to kind of like watch everything. Like, where can I escape to? How can I pretend I'm not here? Like hiding in a closet, literally. So you're doing things um, that um, you wouldn't ordinarily do based on the fact that your environment is all of a sudden managing a crisis at any given point. And he would say things, the, mo the most racist and homophobic things. And keep in mind, when I was like seven or eight or nine years old, I really had no idea what the words meant. I did not know who the words really were connected to. I would see him watching Eyewitness News. And when he would be getting uh, angry with whatever was happening, he would bite his finger so hard it would bleed. And I just, and, and he would be cursing at the television and just, I would be like in the other room, just like watching this guy kind of vent in his own way. And sometimes he would be screaming. I don't even think he knew he was yelling. I, th I think his own voices were like coming out, like your inside voice was your outside voice. But do there's got to be, that, I was going to say, do you think that was his release from, from being a cop? There's got to be a reason. Yeah. There's, there's a few factors. Police work was a, a, a significant factor contributing to his behavior. Um, but even though I didn't know um, what exactly it was that he was angry about, I just knew, just be careful around this guy. I just, I, I can't get, tr I can't trust him with anything. I don't even know what it is that he's angry about. All I know is try not to ask too many questions. And, um, He's clearly always going to be in a bad mood. Well, so, so, Dad, how's your day? Wasn't a good question. To ask. So that, Not even that, close. Again, that's day? sad because yeah. I that's... was that way. I was. Mm -hmm. I was that way for a long time, and and there's there's times when I am that way. But I I also want to be that person. That I want my kids to tell me, tell me, and and let's let's deal with it together. But there are times I'll get where I'll get fixated. Like I'm I'm and I, it sounds like what your father is. You get fixated on something and just work himself up into a tizzy. Yeah. And that, that's me, even to this day. Like if I see something and I just get focused on it, I can't get my mind off of it. Mm. And that's where I go. And you got to release somehow. You know, whether, whether it be yelling at the TV or, or going out for a run or something, you, once you, and I see it, it happened to me just yesterday too. I'm not going to get into how it happened, but it just kept building and building. Yeah. I, I had a thought in my mind and it just kept building and building. Because it festers. Oh, yeah. So that was the, that was only one factor. The other factor, which I didn't know till years later, was that my father really had uh, severe sleep apnea. And he would maladapt to his apnea by taking in uh, more calories. Uh, he ended up, well, at one point, just before I was born, he quit uh, smoking, picked up food, and it just compounded. And then he had all these comorbidities, which developed into type 2 diabetes, which was starting to get out of control. And... Sleeping disorders with police work are not uncommon based on the fact that we have constant disruptions with our circadian rhythms. So that compounded with the fact that he had uh, undiagnosed apnea um, would just create this little monster. So he had like an addi addictive personality, kind of? Like, what, did he drink? or? <sighs> no, he wasn't much of a drinker, um, but he definitely, and I don't want to get too clinical, but like his mood dysregulation. Like, like where he'd be up and down and like the like anger moments where you, you, if you, if you came in and, and at the wrong time, you might, you know, catch a, catch a swing. But as a, as a boy, knowing something's going on, that's that you're, you're, you're a different from what your friends are looking at. That had to be horrifying. Well, that's why I was like, he is, I am never, ever <laughs> gonna come out to going him. to tell him anything um about me um <clears throat> no black people could come in the house definitely no gay men i i i um, I, I dealt with that too all right so i and i'm like okay sure the other thing was don't get a girl pregnant and i'm like oh thank god i know i got that one down <laughs> not a chance dad <laughs> you know dad <laughs> fine <These> deal deal <laughs> that was probably uh -oh. the most um shaping of of when i felt most comfortable to come out or not come out and i didn't and then my my friend is like, who ended up telling my parents uh yeah i know who we're met with who he's with and these two guys they met on the internet and he's gay so 
Your friend outed you? She. She. Um, it's she. always a woman. Yep. It's always a woman. Well, <laughs> root of all evil. I told her originally, I said, if something happens. Here's where I am. Here's where I am. Who? Here's who I'm with. Father's complete denial, thinking that I was, you know, brainwashed. It's just a phase. Just a phase. And um, it w- clearly it wasn't, but he was in, in, in a position where this just is not possible. Um, it's funny. See, because- your, your father said, don't get a girl pregnant and don't bring black people into the house. The rebellious me oh, yeah. would have got a black girl pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... You know what? There is something to that where it's like, you know, if you told if you told me that, you know, don't touch the stove, it's You're going to touch it. Right. I didn't even think about the stove being there until yeah. you mentioned it. Well, it's hard for a parent to wrap their head around. And, and when and Mark and Ashley are in here, we talked about this because I believe their parents are saints. What they put their parents to is, is uh, things of nightmares. But when you have a child, you just want the best life for the child. You got to remember. Our parents grew up in an era yeah. where homosexuality was not a very popular thing, and it was a very difficult life. I rem- I recall this. I've said this many times on this show. My grandfather, who I believe was a very enlightened man, said, yeah. he he says, don't be hard on pe- on gay people, and I'll tell you why because. They didn't choose that lifestyle. It's a very, at the time, it was a very difficult lifestyle, and you don't choose a difficult lifestyle. You don't make your life harder. Life's hard enough. And I always thought that was was a very profound yeah. thing to say. And this was this was a guy who grew up, you know, he was born in 1913. So, but you know, just just getting back to one thing you said, the parents want kids to live their best lifestyle, right? That is their best lifestyle. Or the path of is least it, is resistance. It, is it I mean, the, there's a few. Is it the parents thought of a good lifestyle? Yes. Or is it child's thought of a good lifestyle? It is always the parents thought yeah, of a good lifestyle. Exactly. They live vicariously or they already have been around the block once or twice and know like, hey, if this, if you choose this, this is what you're going to experience. If you choose that, this is likely what you're going to experience. I mean, growing up in the 80s, my parents clearly saw what was happening throughout the AIDS epidemic and just how marginalized LGBT, LGBT, but particularly gay men, were going through. Um, yeah, we talked so, about that because AIDS was a gay, gay man's disease. Yeah, exactly. Right. It wasn't really till Ryan White story kind of hit that, you oh know. Oh, my God, the, I forgot the, about Ryan White. Oh. I mean, there, there's certain things that if it happens to certain people, then all of a sudden, now it's in your backyard. Now it's something that matters. Greg Luganis, then, remember the yeah, Olympic but, diver? But Greg Luganis is gay, Johnson, though, right? All of these yeah. things. Greg Luganis is gay, but Arthur Ryan. Ash. Arthur Ashe was another one. Yeah. Um, the guy who played Predator. I don't know his name. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he did blood transfusion. And all of a sudden, everybody got real scared because, hey, as long as it's kept to this sect, which isn't a popular yeah. sect at the time, it's okay. It's okay. Right. It's not a big threat. But then when it became a big threat to the, the masses, now you're like, oh, shit. Now it's us. Now it's us. So your parents found you at this house. Yeah. Uh, well, I had to <laughs> go to uh, a local police station to be uh, picked up and then brought over well, back home. How old were you at this point? I was like 16. Yeah. Wow. So, Knocking socks with two guys. That'll happen. No, I wasn't. Oh, you just hanging out? Yep. Is this air quotes hanging out? Or no. just hanging out? No, it was just, it was literally. Was it hanging out? <laughs> nothing like that. But, nothing like that. I wanted to be like... I didn't want to be in my neighborhood or close by because if I was, then you would be found out. So, you know, one of the things that I would always try to figure out is how do you out yourself far enough away from home so that you it won't come back to bite you or that it can't find you. And it just so happened, you know, my your play, best lane plans. I, I, <laughs> I was actually at work that day. I worked in a tuxedo store and I left early. And for some reason, my parents had to come to the uh, to the store to like drop off a jacket, and then we found that I wasn't there. The whole story unraveled. Oh damn! So had it not been cold that night, I might have had a completely different trajectory in my childhood development when it came to this particular issue. Did your parents <laughs> ever accept you over time? Oh yeah. Okay. But it took many, many years. I went many years without talking to my father, so like you're... like a, a, a void of silence throughout. The remainder of my high school, a majority of my college. Real in high school, so okay. you're still living at home, and they're not talking to you. I and I'm trying to find a way to be not home. Okay. I joined the rescue squad, and that's when I kind of got my first introduction to emergency services. And 
at that time, I don't know if they still call them this, or maybe it's a, it just where I was uh, on and, um, being an EMT, but they called it blue night, blue light spe- specials. Yeah. Okay. So they still do Jolly that. volleys, blue lighters. Yeah. Right. So um, I was doing it actually to just have a place to stay on a Friday and Saturday night. And uh, clearly I'm picking up some skills and I became an EMT. But I was really doing it to just not be home. A little escape. It, w- it was escapism. But I was uh, at Safe least place. doing it adaptively. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't, and they, they struggle with it, and they go through the throes of alcoholism and yeah, drug addiction. Absolutely. Was there ever once that, that internally you said, God, if I could just change this about myself, oh, my course. parents would be more accepting? Absolutely. And did you ever try? No. Um, or was it a rebellious mm-hmm. thing? Like, well, screw you, I'm not trying at all now. It, th- this has nothing to do with rebellion. I mean, why would anybody put themselves through yeah. this? No, no, I'm not but, saying I'm not saying it's about it's about rebellion. No, the fact that if you have this in you, where you say, "If I could just change this one thing, my parents would accept me a little bit more." Um, I knew I knew it wouldn't change, so I did everything I could to try to make them proud of me in other ways. You mm-hmm. overcompensate. Yeah, it's like, all right, well, I'm first in this, president of that, first of this. You know, great here, people love me funny guy, all these things that people seem to draw you in so that when that hammer comes down, you know, if, but if the, it, look at the list of good. Right. And look at the it's list like, of what right. you think is bad. Right. Now, now you said your father, you didn't talk to him. How, how was your mother, your mother? Uh, she and, was caught in the middle and of it. do you have siblings? I do. I have one sister. She's uh, three and a half years older than me. Was she a little bit more open to it? Uh, my mom and my sister were kind of like, yeah, they, they were certainly more Less unaccepting, and then you know the the shock wasn't as bad. Um, yeah, his, his but, but my father really went through a tough time. His, his sister felt safe bringing her friends over. Then I <laughs> think he, he, oh, I she's think, off the hook. <laughs> I think every parent has had a conversation at one time, whether they like to admit it or not. You know, you have a baby boy or a baby girl, and you have your spouse there. And I know me, and my wife have spoken about it. I'll, I'll tell you very openly and honestly. It's like, well, what if he's gay? And I remember my wife asking me that question. I said, as long as he's not a Yankees fan, I'm cool. I'm uh, good. I'm good. Because you know, a Yankees fan will get him thrown right out of my house. I think, I think every wife asks that question. Yeah. When, when I had my son, my, my ex-wife said, you know, what if he's gay? I said, I'm still going to love him. Yeah. It's my son. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what was that movie, Corky Romano? But a lot of, I mean, you know what, though? Unfortunately, a lot of parents do say that, but deep down, some of them don't. They're going to say that to their friends. Like, I would always love my kid. No, I know a lot of people that that uh, turn away their children. Oh yeah, but I, I never see their, their I, parents I can after tell they come you, out. I can tell you with full confidence, there is not a thing in the world that would make me turn away my child. There's just nothing in the world that is fathomable to to mm. do that. I don't care if they if they kill somebody, I'm going to help them hide the body. That's the yeah. way it goes uh, because they're my boys, yeah. and I'll love them no matter what. And guess what? I would sit in a jail cell for them. So they didn't have to experience that. That's that's my way of thinking, and I, I can say with full confidence, I would not be that guy. Yeah, it's Yankees fan. That's so. Different. So, so in other words, if I did something like that, Kevin, I'm a Yankee fan, so Kevin would die me right out. There he is, officer, right yep, there. Yep, he's right there. I'd be like, <laughs> here's the pitches. Take him. I don't want to say he did it, but he is a Yankees fan, and that usually means that. And the Yankees come in and steal Christmas presents. Isn't yes, they do. I tell my kids that. I tell my kids that. So the you 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 want to overachieve. You want to make your parents proud. All right. You because you know it's inevitably going to happen somewhere or another. Every kid kid knows eventually this conversation is going to happen. So, um, it almost, it it puts people into like a fork in the road and they got to figure out what they're going to do. They're either going to be living their authentic self early on without building up everything else, credentials, grades, money, whatever it is. Or do you live, uh, with this kind of, with the hopes that now maybe they'll eventually come around. So, and you got to figure out when that time might be. So you you test the waters. You maybe you'll bring over a friend that happens to be gay and just see how that works. Or um, like a lead balloon in my house, not or, not my parents' house, not my house. You, you do something to test the waters. I didn't have to do that. I knew exactly what the waters were. They were completely tumultuous. You know, they were shark infested. You would be eaten alive. Muddy not waters. a chance. So when you when you tried to become a police officer, hmm. was that psychologically a little jab? To your dad, like, yeah, even though I'm gay, I can still do that job and I can do it well. 
That, you know, that's actually a good question. You wonder if when your parents tell you don't do something, if that's exactly what you want to do. But it was always in the back of my mind to do something in public service or, you know, not to be behind a desk, so to speak. Well, when you got on it, it was there was different reasons to take the job than there is today. It's more of a service oriented calling. I think it, it still was for me then. I mean, I got back. I got on in two thousand two. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, now, okay. Now's a little different. It's you, they're, they're oh today high, high yeah. salaries. It's a business. You get a good li- you know you you do well. Um, oh yeah, yeah, right. As far as uh, you know, money or, or the the stability of 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 of, of right. having a constant paycheck, which um, I uh, that was a motivating factor because I had the chance of being homeless. I didn't know if my father was like, "You're done. You're out. Goodbye." You know, you bring an F in this house, I'll shoot him. He he would say things like this. You can say the word if you want. Yeah. I look. I, I I prefer when he went when he was when 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 he was at his worst, and I mean his worst. Um, he was still on the job, and uh, one night, this is after I came out or after he found out, um, I was at the front door, and um, he was kind of like shaking. And like there was something wrong here, and I'm like, "Well, am I allowed back in here?" And um, he had his gun, and he started to put it in my direction, and I was just like, all of a sudden, like, I felt this sense of calm, and I was just like, "I think he's gonna kill me," and I didn't care, so I walked closer to him. I said, "Just do it, just do it," and I called the bluff. And then he started to cry a little bit. He dropped the gun, and I walked out of the house. Wow. God damn. 16. <sighs> but the thing is this. Now, should I have done that? Of course not. But what are you going to do? Run away though? He'll shoot you in the back. The other the other option was to constantly figure out for my entire life what else am I going to do here to manage my life. So I would always be looking for other support networks because my family was a possibility that they would just not be there. So it was a rescue squad. It was a volunteer service that would keep me overnight. It was a church. It was friends' houses. Um, it was anybody that might be something to just give me shelter, to give me some sense of stability. I knew I had some form of worth. I knew it was something I had to give to the world. Just give me a couple of years to get on my feet. And then once I got into college, I was just like, I'm out of this place. Like this, this is I can finally do what I want. I can be who I want to be. I can spread my wings. I can prove him wrong. And a lot of that ended up coming to true where it's like, did I do this on purpose? Now, this is the point at which I said, because he said um, at one point, you'll never be anything without me or without us. Um, and I presume that he felt that there's no way that a child is going to be able to support themselves or survive, especially after coming out. So he felt it would almost force me back into some form of heterosexuality. Yeah. Um, and I was like, thank you very much. Now I'm going to prove you wrong. So l- let me ask this question. Because uh, th- so you just said something there that, that kind of little resonated with me. He said these things to you. Being so far removed from that situation, do you think it was his attempt? Because he felt like he was losing his boy. Okay. And he and he felt like he was losing his boy when you be, when you told him you were gay or it came out that you were gay. He felt like he was losing his boy. And being a police officer for as long as you have been, you know, a lot of us are control freaks. We have to control situations. And a lot of times we were forced to control situations. He was a police officer. Just to give you some compassion, I'm not excusing his behavior, but, you know, he thought he was losing you. And he, that was his last ditch effort. And he probably didn't have the tools that you have in order to deal with. Oh, he, now that I look back at him, like he has so many other things going on. Minus me being gay. There there were so many other problems he had going on with his health. Hmm. Um, And I wish I knew back then all of those things, like what was happening to him. Um, And I would have been been, maybe a little more sympathetic. I would have been a lot more compassionate. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, And just. Then when I finally, when I graduated college and I, I got on the job immediately, it was, it was just like four year degree. Got it. I get, I get a call the next day. Literally. Did he finally go, Hey, maybe this gay thing isn't so bad. <laughs> it seems to be working out really good for Matt. He sits me down. Um, and he's like, we need to talk. And I'm, you know, we, we, we broke bread, but, 
um, and we went back in time to when I was like seven or eight or nine years old. Um, when I first started telling him, you know, what is it like to be a police officer? Or maybe I would want to be one one day. And keep in mind, a nine-year-old. Right? Um, he said, son, if you become a police officer, you are going to see things that most people never should see. And you're going to see some of the worst in, human, in, in humanity. Then you have to leave police headquarters and meet the public. <laughs> Damn, that's... There is no truer statement yeah. than what your father just said. But for a nine-year-old to hear that, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. What does that mean? Crabs in a barrel. Right? So, I, but I remembered it. So he told me that again. And he said, you have to be very careful. I didn't want to become who I became. And I used to make fun of people like you. I used to, all the, all the guys in my department did, we used to make fun of gay cops all the time, especially the ones that were straight. So I'm like, now is this, that was one of the most ignorant statements I ever heard. But what he really meant was, it's the temperament that they were really going after. It's the, the hypermasculinity that is required. It's almost as if your sexuality doesn't matter as long as you fit the image and could do the job. Well, if you think about it, so you, like I, like I said before, you have a very calming, de-escalating voice. You know in the gay community there are certain gay men that roll their asses and are effeminate. Yeah. You, know, you know what I'm talking about. So can you imagine, I don't, I don't, I don't want to... I presume he thought that that's would inevitably be my yeah. destiny or that... You what I, a shade you're, pulling over, you're pulling over a car and you're saying it in an effeminate voice. Nobody's going to take you seriously. And it was probably a real fear of his. Yeah. Um, the, it would be a switch, like all of a sudden your voice would elevate and you'd be gesturing with your hands more and say I'm, fabulous twice, right. you know, say fabulous <laughs> quite a bit. Right. The, these are fears that were, uh, he, he had to see not happen over time in order to accept that it's okay. I have a, a masculine now, son. When, once he, once he got through that, worked through his own issues, because Whatever was wrong in your relationship seemed oh. to be a lot on, it was on him. Once he worked through that stuff, was there any, any type of regret in there that he reacted the way that he did in certain scenarios? Fast forward, um, his, his health was really bad. Like he had a very damaged body from declining, um, uh, from just runaway diabetes. Um, he had toe amputations, then a foot, then a leg. And I'm watching this, this person all of a sudden be piece by piece taken away. And um, at, at the worst part, when um, he had an infection in the other leg, um, our family really started to have a crisis because um, we're now talking about, do we just let it go and allow him to have comfort care or do we fight the infection? Um, you know, does he even know what's going on? Because at this point, he's in assisted living. Um, and I went at it with my mother. I'm like, you have to tell him what's happening to him. Because the medication that he's taking, we have to figure out whether or not it's going to be for long-term care or whether or not he's going to get comfort care. Uh, because if we do comfort care, we let him go. Yeah. If we do the other and we do antibiotics, we have to take him off of that and then go in this other direction. So you get this whirlwind about, you know, biology, medicines, the human body, what's possible, what's not, how far along is he, all that. And um, she goes, well, I'm not going to tell him that he needs the other surgery. I'm just going to tell him that you have to go for a doctor's appointment or something. And then I'm like, well, you're going to let him wake up with no legs? <laughs> wake up with, yeah, exactly. I'm like, Dah. so I had to become a man, like really be the father, be the man of the household. And uh, I sat him down. Or he was already sitting down at that point, obviously. And I think he actually already knew what I was about to say. And just slowly, I was like, Dad, you know, you have this infection. And um, if they don't remove it um, in the way in which it has detastasized, um, you're going to die. So the alternative to doing that and letting this thing ransack your body, which will be extraordinarily painful because it's gonna, the infection is going to get into your bones. Um, the only way to do this is to remove your other leg. And just, he was crying and crying and I'm, I was crying with him and I was holding his hands 
And I said, I'm going to be with you this entire time. And that's when he opened up and he just apologized for everything. He said, Matt, it wasn't worth it. My entire life of hate, like I just, it wasn't worth it. Just if there's anything you learn from me, I just don't want you to become me. Don't become a monster. People are going to turn their back on you. You're going to want to hurt them that hurt you. Don't let it happen. If you think about it, that's going to be a miserable existence, hating everything every day. Like you said, he's, he's, yelling, at the, he's yelling at the TV about the news and all that stuff. Yeah. It, it doesn't concern me. I tell people all the time. Everybody, <laughs> How is this affecting your life? Yeah, exactly. But it's not. I tell people all the time, like, oh, did you hear what happened? Is, if my name doesn't come up, I don't care. <laughs> right. If my name comes up, then I'll care about it. Because you're not going to change it. Yeah. So I'm assuming your father is no longer here. Yeah, no, he passed. He passed. But there was some peace at the end of his life. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we, I mean, it, anything that was just uh, unsaid or ambiguous was like, <laughs> I'm going to just let it let it be and we're going to just talk about everything. And then how big of a weight off your shoulders? Everything. We, yeah. we, we became so close. He told me so many words of wisdom that finally started to make more sense as an adult and as a police officer as opposed to being a child. You know, you're going to understand language differently after you experience it. Of course. Um, and I, I don't know if you read this in, the, in my bio, but <laughs> when I got into this police department originally, I did get wrongfully terminated uh, two years in. And I yes, thought that, I yeah, so I the, it was, I had two wrongful terminations and this was on the heels of uh, a major storm that happened in the town in which I ended up pulling a couple people out of a flood, a flooded area. And it did this in front of a supervisor who, um, let's just say he wishes it was him instead. Hmm. Um, and my father said at one point, he goes, Matt, don't do the right thing in front of the wrong cop. And I was like, well, what, what is that supposed to mean? He goes, you'll know what I mean when, you, when, when it happens. When it happens, exactly. A couple days later, um, that made the press. Um, you know, junior officer saves two people. Uh, and I um, get a citation for having bald tires on my police car. <laughs> and I call him up immediately. And he goes, I told you about this. He goes, be very careful about that one. He goes, you didn't save two people's lives that day. You took two life savings awards from a senior officer, and you're going to pay for that. A month after that, I was fired. And you fought to get your job back. Fought to get my job back. That attorney was like trying to pull out, like, come on, like, like what probationary period did you not pass after doing that? And I told him, I said, I, he goes, he, have, and my attorney asked me immediately, because are you gay? I'm like, what if I am? He goes, are you? I said, yes. He goes. <sighs> score like he's roping me he knows what this is he's just ching cha ching cha ching cha ching and i'm like my life is ruined you know and by the way they didn't just fire you like come into the office they waited till i was on vacation in europe and tried to fire me on my cell phone oh that's that's a that's a i i used to have a boss that whatever he would charge you would do it on a friday of your weekend yeah. off right yeah. yeah or a thursday mm -hmm. before you go on your long weekend so your weekend screwed but that's well this is done because if you don't respond in 10 days your lawsuit would be Lawsuit would be mute. Uh, mute, you know, mute. Yeah. So, you mean something that was a coincidence? Probably not. I had that lawsuit in in four days or less. Well, so it, it's a lot like this for, for people to understand. If you want to pull over a car, mm -hmm. if you're an officer with half a brain, you're going to find something to pull that car off over. Yep. So if, if they if they're operating, they're violating. Correct. If you if they don't like you for whatever reason, they don't like you. Whether it's you're gay or whether it's you know, your certain height, whatever it may be, they're going to find something and they're going to try to make it stick. So what that does, because I spent my whole career like this, it builds up anxiety and it sits right about here. It's a killer. Yeah. And, you know, I used to throw up before I went on patrol. And when right. I was on patrol, it was fine because of the anxiety of the most inhumane people in the world. And then you go hit the streets. That's that's one of the the, the best lines I ever heard. You're going to see the worst of the worst things that people should never see. And then you're going to go hit the streets. Right. Like, damn, that is a profound statement because yeah. that's the truth. So he, he knew these things and he was like, there's no anybody else. I knew who I was. I'm his flesh and blood. He goes, he's not. He's going to continue to do this. Yeah. I just don't want you to go through this. And he, after that wrongful termination, he goes, just you have to get out of there. But what also happened is that, that chief talked to every other chief 
in the area, told them what he did, and they knew that this guy is going to be looking for a job soon. And they're like, we're not going to touch this guy with a 10-foot pole. Yeah. We have no idea why you did that to him. Clearly, you're not going to get away with it. But you're now a marked man, and you're damaged goods. So it ended up having the adverse effect and cementing me into the department. You know, even if you said casually, you know, if it's if you don't feel like our our culture here is working out, we would understand. No, no, no. They just said, let's go after him. And if we can't and they started running out of time, they did this instead. But see, now you get your job back. And I started a 10 year long campaign to try to get me to continue to quit. So that you get your job back. I would think I would think that, okay, you beat him once. There's no way they're going to touch you again and get spanked twice. But apparently that's not so because yeah. of the arrogance. There's in in the older police there was very there's no often, oversight. A lot of lot of what arrogance. They, wh- who they think that you know they it, think once, they're you God. Have, once you have 25 years on, even if I do get jammed up, a scoop before it really gets yeah, bad. I always called fuck you time. I got 25 years. Something happens. Fuck you. I'm leaving. But <sighs> I think that the problem with this. Did you go after them personally or just after the department? No, I didn't go after any after anything. Yeah. I, I I went after my job I'm to get my job you, back. Yeah. I mean, you you just sued to get your job back. Uh, the the first lawsuit was for a wrongful termination. Um, the second lawsuit for the second wrongful termination was for wrongful termination and sexual harassment because you need. I knew what was happening to me, uh, but I wouldn't have been able to prove it. I would have needed needed um, more more evidence, if you will, to show what's been happening behind the scenes, because I'm not blind. I'm not dumb. I know what's happening. You let certain things slide. Certain things are just horseplay. Other things are definitely mean and mean spirited and trying to hurt you and trying to get you to feel uncomfortable. Um, But I knew I needed more time to eventually get to that type of complaint. To build up a case. To build the case. You was did you ever get any pushback with one of your two lawsuits where people are saying, Oh, he's pulling the gay card? Of course, everyone's gonna think that. Yeah. But they don't know the and they also think and this is New Jersey, this is after marriage equality. The majority of the public is on this high of <laughs> discrimination has fallen. This doesn't happen anymore. Clearly this would not be happening at this time in this place, twenty minutes outside New York City. This 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 has got to be something other than sounds him like being a movie. There. Yeah, yeah. It, he was probably right. a screw up, and right. and, and they're because d- they see things in movies. They're like you, you, cops, you know, shoot people in inadver- accidentally, and you know, like somehow keep their job. What did you do to get fired? Mm. So it's not believable that wrongful terminations of this nature still occur. Um, well, I had a boss that tried to fire me every single day I worked. I'm not kidding you. Well, like George Jetson? Yeah. Every, yeah. yeah. It was like Mr. Spacely. You were a fryer. Yeah. Yep. It was like I Mr. felt Spacely. the same way. It was, it was every... Spacely sprockets. sprockets. His, so Mike's police experience <laughs> is so vastly different from my police experience. Yeah. The, the thing that brought us together is our love for the job. Mike was... Mike was I guess you were on the A-team, and I, I don't mean yeah, that derogatory. Absolutely. You were on the A-team. I was not on the A-team. Yeah, they're in Be- or out. Because... In my opinion, I took a job to protect people that couldn't protect themselves, all right? So things are going on within the department that are wrong. And if I close my mouth, I am complicit. I am not being a police officer. I am not doing what my job yep. entailed. And especially I, when, once I got involved in the unions, it was, it was over. I mean, my, my career was over. Yeah. And I knew that. And I knew that. But it didn't, <laughs> you know, and listen, I'm a bonehead too. I used to poke the bear a lot. I used to poke the bear. I used to use big words, and he didn't have a very big vocabulary, so I knew it would piss him off. I, did, I knew what I was doing. Uh, well, I just I just wanted to be an officer. That That's all. I didn't want anything more. I didn't want an award or even a newspaper article. But at the time of the – just before the wrongful termination, the first one, I figured finally I was able to do something to prove myself. Well, um, what, and I thought that – what was the original role for termination for? They said I was probationary. The bald tires. Oh, yes. no, well, no, no, that was just a citation. That was just a rip to let you know what's coming next. In pro- oh, in probationary officers, you could be I pretty trans- much gone at any You didn't any complete time. your probationary but period. But I did, yeah. and that's actually, the they didn't have grounds. When I transferred from Booton to Glenrock, I was already in G- G- Booton Township for over a year. Your, your tenure transfers with you. They wanted to have it both ways to say, we're going to put you back on probation, even though it's false. And then try to implement it on top of it. It was a violation of my civil rights for them to do it in the very first place. But Glenn Rock wanted to save money and they tried to pull this. You know why you're such a dangerous human being? Not because... Because he's smart. 
Because you're smart. <laughs> exactly. Because you think things through. And I'm, I'm sure there was some rash decision making in there. You have to, yeah. But, you know, you would think that at certain points, people that don't, don't hate or, or, or hate gay people, that you would do something that, like, well, if they do that, maybe they're not so bad. And that happened. Uh, several years after the first wrongful termination, um, we had a save, um, and it wasn't just, you know, a CPR save, any, any CPR save. It wasn't just somebody that, you, you know, it was known to the department. It wasn't just your boss. It wasn't even your boss's boss. It was my boss's 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 wife. Whoa. The mayor's wife dies. Codes. We bring her back. Wow. A few days later, she's she gets out of it. Congratulations, you saved a life. Go to, you know, we have this pop of circumstance, give him a plaque, pictures taken. Thank you so much. She's crying, shaking my hand. She doesn't know who I am. I barely know who she was. You know, you, know, you don't know the, the, the family members of people. But at least I'm in good graces now with the mayor because I was able to be a contributing factor to the life that you still enjoy today with the person that you love the most. During the second wrongful termination, he had to get deposed. And it came up. My attorney just said, uh, Officer Stanislaw, um, did he, uh, he was there the night your, your wife died and he brought him, he brought her back, like, he saved her, like, he, sa he saved her life. And he goes, um, I don't remember. Yeah. At that point, I was about to jump out of my skin. He doesn't remember the guy who's responsible for saving his own wife's life. And, and, and the uh -huh. guy he probably gave an award to. And he should have been put in jail right there because he's clearly lying. Yeah. Right. So, well, and my attorney's like, Matt, we know that he's lying. We have to do this in order to show the type of hatred towards you. And this is where it really hurts because it's like you could do nothing right ever. And on top of that, if you ever do, they're going to go after you more because you're never the winner. They choose the winners before the game is even played. For you to actually win a game without that being manipulated is going to give a very visceral reaction to those who need the spotlight all the time. Did, so did, he just, so that entire time, like he kept, he's like, do you have dementia? Like he was like, I don't know, ironically. <laughs> but he dementia? refused uh, let me think about to, that. he refused to acknowledge that not only did I say it was like, like you gave him an award. It was in the newspaper. Here's a picture of it. Like all these things. Are, I, don't, I don't remember. Wow. So that's when I really started to understand how deep either hatred is or how much love is for oneself over others. Because sometimes people say, hey, I don't hate gay people. I just like straight people that much more. I'm like, that's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's just manipulating the words. But how did the rank and file, or how do they treat you to this day? They're fine now. They're fine. <laughs> they're tired of getting spanked by a smart, smart well, guy. Well, no, the, the, the whole administration was retired or was forced to resign. One was put in prison. I saw that. I mean, the head and shoulders of the department were off in a year and a half. So um, that created this huge vacuum. You gave hope to everybody else who was everyone that was stuck in middle management yeah. was all of a sudden going to rise to the top, and anybody who thought they were going to be stuck in the ranks for until they retired, all of a sudden they had an opportunity for promotions. So, not that I'm a hero, not that, that I did that, but that's what ended up happening. Open doors, and that's what it did. wide open. Yeah. Did anybody finally come up to you and say, "Thank you, thank you for standing up"? Not inside the police department that I can remember. Some people in the like like the public, the community, um, they tell like you know good good for fighting them, you know, and giving them back, you know, what they gave to you. And I I said I why are you thanking me? They're like because I would never be able to do something like that. I said how could you not? You stand everything... up for yourself. No, but everything was taken away from me. I was given nothing, nothing. And I guarantee you were scared shitless the but whole you time. You can't get a job. You can't get work. There's there's nothing. Every you you're you're a pariah. So I sold my story, if you will, to Columbia University, and I told them this is what they did to me, and this is how they're trying to get away with it. Because they give you one question to try to get into the school for uh, social work. And it was um, basically, why should we let you in? I said, well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I got a little story for you. And they're like, and I had no idea that I was going to get in, but I, one of my friends said, no, that school's going to watch you. 
you're going to get in. And I did. And I ended up getting into another school, a uh, teacher's college for a PsyD if I wanted to jump on that track too. But I ended up just doing social work at this time. So so you're still currently on the job? Oh, yeah. 22 yeah. years. 22 years. You're coming at the sunset of your career. But it sounds like also that you set yourself up for a nice little gig that I think you're very aptly suited for mm. after retirement. Yeah. Doing podcasts? Doing podcasts. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one, one, one question I have, though. Being, being a gay police officer, did you always feel that you had to prove yourself every day? Or did you feel like all eyes are on you or is like, you know? See, in the could, beginning, could like, in the beginning, you can say, you know, that, knew, that's that fat cop over there. That's that this cop. That's a gay cop. Uh, in the beginning, yes. But then after I was fired after, you know, putting my life at risk and saving two people, I knew automatically there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to achieve what it must be to be heterosexual. That's such a privilege. So the first 10 years of my career was just treading water. You just and and that's what was taken away from me the most. You don't have a chance to really grow or to feel the confidence to say like I can do this or people can trust my knowledge or my my aptitude or anything. Just how I manage calls, how I manage people. I don't. I. I you don't believe in yourself because you're told and you're pointed at as if you ever get out of your position in life that we put you in, you're going to pay for that. That's, so you stay there and you don't. That's having definitions of what a tribe should be. And police work is very tribal. All right. I have blinders on to what the possibilities are. This is what a cop should be. And if anybody that steps outside of what my vision of that is, they're going to be rejected. And that's that's most that's most police departments. So it's mm. but it's a wonder it's it's a wonderful thing that you're able to overcome this stuff and rise above it. Because listen, the cream always rises to the top. So does scum. So, <laughs> you, you know, there's, there's a my lot. My father's the one who told me that one. Write that one down, too. Yeah. Oh, you're taking all my lines, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking oh, all my lines. Right. They're not even mine. This is my father. We're, we're steal, we're, 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 good. Your father can't blame yeah. us then because we're stealing all his Yo, lines. Yeah, oh, my God. So how, how <laughs> you really did make your father proud. Uh, yes. And he definitely, like, he was, he even said to me, he goes, man, I can't tell you how. Like you really gave it to them, Matt. Because every day you're back there shows them that you were not only right, but that they were wrong. It's another turn in a screwdriver every time. It's like, but I'm not door. doing that for that reason. He goes, trust me, those people wanted to be in those positions to the day they turned 65. I and and he 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 knows like how departments run. He goes, you've had three at that time. We had three police chiefs since President Eisenhower. <laughs> Yeah, but you personified what a police officer is supposed to be. This is what I said earlier. Your job as a police officer is to protect people who can't always protect themselves. You step in there. You step in front of that, that danger, that hazard. A lot of times, police officers have a tough time doing that for themselves, and that's what you did. Yeah. So every good attribute that I think a police officer should be, the basic attributes, you should be courageous, even in the face of enormous odds and adversity. You overcome it. You face it. You do use courage. And that's what you did. So I don't care what you do when you go home. You, to me, from what you just told me, personify everything that a good police officer oh, should be. Well, thank you. So, it's what you do inside that door. You know, right. once, once you go into headquarters and go out for your shift, that's like you said. That's the test. I don't, I don't care what you do yeah. when you go home. You know, yeah. nobody knows well, what goes on behind closed can, doors. Believe it, don't let him fool you. He cares a little bit more what happens when you go home. He's going to ask you some questions after. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming to the end of this thing here. Anything you want to plug? Oh, um, besides Kevin. Oh, will you stop it? I get that from Nick. That, <laughs> okay, stop. You know, I if there's like one thing that the world should know or that cops should know is that you, you know, you don't have to have a disorder in order to talk to a, a, th a therapist. Oh, I know that all too well. Um, okay. And that you can do routine maintenance in order to kind of keep yourself in a way that is structured and that you can kind of get, take stock of your life. Um, because a lot of times you just grind and grind and grind and you don't even know that the changes are happening until something that's so clearly obvious just hits you. Um, well, you get your oil changed in your car, even though it's running fine. Same it's routine it's, maintenance. Yeah, it's, that's you know, that's it a very good. That's what I was going to say. I mean, you, you had to go through a lot of stress in your career. Did you talk to people about it? Uh, well, I had therapists yeah, at the time. That's and, what I'm saying. And yeah, one, I didn't one, get one it. of them, when I was going through my um, uh, the second wrongful termination, I 
he, you know, was helping me through and he's like, well, tell me what you're doing to cope. And I said, I, I applied to Columbia University School of Social Work and Columbia University. It's a little different from what he's used to hearing. And yeah. he goes, um, well, any other schools, Matt? And I was just like, no. Nope. So it. he's like, this kid's going to jump off a bridge the minute he finds out he's getting rejected from these schools. that got accepted into both. So he's like, this is the time to celebrate. And I'm like, well, I'm going to start studying because yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. So, so like I said, yeah. we're coming to the end of this thing, Matt. This, is, this has been a crazy and amazing story. Yeah, unbelievable. One of the things I always like to ask all of our guests that come in here, you've gone through this life, you, you've been wrongfully terminated, attempted, discriminated against, grew up in a household full of hate and full of bigotry. You and got, love. It, it, that's, I, think, I think all of it was an underlying love <laughs> thing, but it was just exhibited in the wrong way. You've experienced an enormous amount of suffering. What do you think it's taught you? It can get better if you give it time. Uh, just you have to find your way. Most kids are, or most people in general that feel lost, and there's a lot of kids, a lot, a lot of adults for that matter, just feel lost, and they're just looking for something to orbit around, and they just can't find it. If you can't find it, don't let it, and then you think you found something, if it's hate, or if it's people being pit against each other, um, that's not the answer. Don't find something else. There's got to be something else other than having an adversary in order to function or to have some form of uh, identity. You know, it really, you, you need to really dig. And for me, it was not just police work, but it was advanced clinical work to, to help people that are at risk. And, you know, that found me in the middle of the midst of, of all this trauma. But, and I've never been stronger, but just find it and don't go into those, those easy, easy outs of just hate. Well, you know what it is? I, I think there's people that, that don't like themselves, so they have to cause drama and controversy just to bring people down to their level. That's what we spoke about tonight on Instagram yep. Live. It's exactly the reason. Mm -hmm. Matt, I can't thank you enough for coming in here. This oh, has been yeah. this has been great. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. You told man. me some stuff that widened my eyes. Oh, yeah, that was that was pretty good, man. Yeah. That was pretty good. Well, maybe next time we'll we'll go into some psychology. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want to get inside these two. Yeah, no. maybe right. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Let, let's keep it like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast: The Suffering of a Gay Police Officer with Matt Stanislao. That's it. See, I, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm You're getting better. Yeah. <laughs> you studied. And as always, let's think about all the stuff that we learned here. Opinions change through civil discussions. A job is more about attitude. Compassion is needed the most for the uncompass uncompassionate. Don't do the right thing in front of the wrong people. The cream always rises to the top, but so does the scum. But most importantly, courage is being afraid but going and doing it anyway. Yeah. That's going to do it for this episode. Don't forget to go to popple.com. Look for a digital business card. Put in the code TSP20 at checkout for a 20% discount. Follow us on all social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn, Clapper, uh, Facebook. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. We will see you on the next episode.